Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, we are having a conversation with Clément Lesage and Federico Ast from the project Cleros. Cleros is a project that seeks to merge, uh, merge the field of decentralized arbitration with, of arbitration with blockchain technology to create decentralized arbitration where commercial disputes and other disputes can be solved through a group of decentralized crowdsourced jurors. Federico and Clément, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. So we can start with uh, Federico. Uh, Federico, tell us a bit about your background and how you... What's your journey towards building Cleros? So my name is Federico Ast. I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, I studied economics and philosophy in the university. Then I started working in the online media and the biggest newspaper in Argentina. Um, then, you know, I, in Argentina, we uh, have um, lots of um, problems in institutions, you know, you may have noticed that Argentina had problems with currency and problems with governance in the in the history. So people here became quite uh, interested at a very early stage about blockchain technology, right? So what is this idea of um, a currency that doesn't depend on a government uh, and a currency that people can, that it's in control of the people, right? Uh, and... Um, at a very early stage also in Argentina, uh, people started to uh, be interested in the applications of blockchain, not only to currencies, but also to the governance processes. Um, some, pro some projects from Argentina, for example, Democracy Earth, started to think of um, how to use blockchain for uh, improving voting system, for preventing fraud in elections. Uh, but no one was really taking... Um, uh, a look at a very important part of governance of a society that is justice systems, right? Uh, you have um, people uh, don't have very good access to justice in lots of the world um, because access is very expensive, justice is very slow. So I started looking into that part of governance and so that's what made me become interested in um, how uh, blockchain technology can be leveraged uh, for uh, making better institutions, right? Uh, in particular, in, in, in justice. Um, so I started working on a concept I called back then crowd jury, that was the crowd source of juries. Uh, and so um, we met with uh, Clement about a year and a half ago, and we were working on quite similar stuff at different uh, sides of the ocean. And we were introduced by uh, a common uh, friend, I would say that's, um, you know, uh, BitNation, uh, this founder, so she uh, met Clement at a hackathon and she knew I was working on decentralized justice and she said, hey guys, you should meet and start building this together. And so uh, here we are. <laughs> so what was Crowd Jury and how did your initial ideas differ from Keros? So um, the idea of Crowd Jury was um, basically... Um, the use of yeah the, the the main concept was use of crowdsourcing for creating a court so in the end you know if you think of what a court is it's basically a um, group of men that they have to analyze information about some event that happened or did not happen right so uh, in the end uh, a trial is like so you have some guy saying something about the other and you have to see what the truth is right um we have learned through uh, the rise of the internet um, that some processes of information analysis can be done faster and cheaper um, by using the intelligence, collective intelligence, right? For example, Wikipedia. So instead of building an uh, encyclopedia like Britannica with one centralized agent and uh, different experts writing, so you can crowdsource the information flow through the internet uh, people, right? So I said, what if we could uh, crowdsource the information analysis that's uh, basically a trial into the crowd, right? Right. So and that was the idea of the, behind the concept of, of crowd jury. 
Um, it was like very, very early stage. So I think when I started thinking about that, so not even Ethereum was launched. So it was like, uh, uh, it was a really, really early stage idea, um, but the technology was not yet there. But some of the, um, of the main, um, yeah, concepts uh, were already in place about the use of crowdsourcing. Uh, but the idea of crowd jury did not have um, the game theory shelling point principle on which Kleros is built. So that was so the engine of Kleros was not present at the early ideas I had about crowd jury. And Clément, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your background? You came from machine learning and, and transitioned over the cryptocurrency, if I'm not mistaken. Can you tell us about that transition? Yeah, so I actually in computer science, um, both in France and the US. And uh, even uh, when I was a student, I was interested by, uh, by crypto, uh, even before the Ethereum sale, uh, mostly uh, like um, playing a bit with Bitcoin, but nothing uh, professional, just like, uh, like a hobbyist. Um, and when I finished my studies, uh, I had Ethereum, which was offering uh, way more uh, possibility uh, to build application um, compared to what Bitcoin was uh, was doing at the time uh, I started being a Bitcoin hobbyist. And uh, so I was interested by the DAO. Uh, I was interested by um, dispute resolution, even at the time of Bitcoin. But at the time of Bitcoin, uh, dispute resolution was basically multi-signature. You have buyer, seller, and an arbitrator, which each have a key of a multi-sig address. And if the transaction goes as expected, both the buyer and the seller sign. And if there is a dispute, uh, the arbitrator sign plus the buyer or plus the seller, uh, depending of uh, the arbitrator ruling. So it was like the early idea of uh, automating um, the enforcement of, uh, of a dispute resolution process. Um, then I got um, also interested by um, e-commerce, decentralized e-commerce, uh, stuff like Open Bazaar. And I was okay, like, what is lacking in Open Bazaar? is clearly a dispute resolution system because it's interesting to, to buy something to uh, anyone on the internet, but if I cannot trust him, how do I know that I'm not just going to get uh, robbed of my money? And as a seller, uh, if I send the product before getting the money, it's the opposite, it's the buyer which can rob me. Um, and um, just having one central as arbitrator was not a method which was uh, acceptable because we need to both trust one person in common and we can, we can do so, but only if we have large institution that we both trust, like PayPal, I trust PayPal not to rob me. Uh, and, uh, the other party will also trust PayPal not to rob me. But since those, uh, institution, uh, this, this company gets so big, then they start to charge monopoly rent, uh, PayPal charge, um, really high fee, not even when there is a dispute, they, they charge fee all the time. So it was not uh, economically optimum. And so the question was, okay, how can I make a decentralized system of dispute to, to solve disputes? And how can I make it scale? And that's, uh, that's how uh, I, I came up with the early ID of Claros. The early ID uh, was to draw people once, and then the second time, if there is an appeal, to draw all the calls. And then, okay, no, this is not going to scale, because even if we have 10% of the dispute which end up in appeal, um, that means uh, that everyone has to review uh, an amount of uh, dispute which is proportional to the amount of dispute. So this won't scale. So the question was, how could we scale um, this kind of dispute resolution mechanism, um, which were also... Um, um, which I did not invent, like, uh, I think uh, the most important previous work is, uh, is TrustCoin, uh, which uh, used the um, shading point uh, to solve dispute. In this case, it was dispute, uh, Oracle dispute on prediction market, but they were asking everyone to vote on everything. And the question was, how can we make this scale uh, to make a real uh, decentralized dispute resolution system, which will be general purpose, not only uh, to solve um, oracle of prediction market dispute, but to solve every kind of, uh, of dispute uh, which can be enforced by smart contracts. 
So yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, some some earlier projects uh, like like Open Bazaar and, and like decentralized e-commerce, and you know, all all of these also need to sort of decentralized dispute resolution system. And it was interesting in the early days to see how they were solving that with multisig. And I mean, just recently, I was confronted by this. I I I, uh, I tried this um, this uh, this software uh, like a decentralized Bitcoin exchange called exchange called Bisc, and um, you know, just tested it out to basically just sort of experiment and, and, and see what the dispute resolution system was. And it, it actually worked quite well. So, I mean, but you do have to put some money in escrow uh, in, in order to secure your um, your transaction. So it, 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 it kind of defeats the purpose, or at least it makes it a little bit more com cumbersome uh, to, to have to put up collateral uh, in order to buy, you know, something. Uh, and so having a dispute resolution system that, um, where you don't have to put up that collateral, but uh, there is some sort of a like a counterparty crowd that can effectively uh, look into uh, a dispute and arbitrate and make a decision is something I think that would be you know quite valuable moving forward as decentralized platforms become more prevalent. So you already need to have a, a collateral um, because smart contract can only uh, move. Uh, value like uh, ETH, short token, or whatever that has been explicitly given control of uh, by someone to the smart contract. So we could say, okay, we, we make a dispute resolution system and we don't ask collateral. But when when there is a ruling, what is going to happen? Nothing, because the smart contract will not have control of the asset of the dispute. So requiring a collateral is um, like a limitation of um, of blockchain-based dispute resolution system, but on the other hand, it means that when you have a ruling, you don't need to have it enforced. It's automatically enforced by the smart contract. You don't need to to go uh, to have a court order uh, to have the police enforcing your ruling, which uh, can be really, really, really more problematic than the need to deposit a collateral. Yeah, what, what I meant by, by collateral was that as a, as a buyer, I also had to put some collateral to secure the other side of the trade, this, which was then um, unlocked once both sides agreed to the transaction. But of course, if you're doing something like web design, you know, the buyer would have to put up the amount or at least some kind of a deposit uh, in order for you know, some collateral to be available uh, if there was a dispute or something of that nature. Um, so let, let's dive right into it. So the project we're talking about here today is Kleros. Um, give us a, a high level overview of the vision of Kleros and why you're building this project. Yeah, so as we were saying before, so we, we have people building these decentralized platforms now, some of them for e-commerce, for freelancing, for others are building for insurance. So um, uh, all of them are going to have disputes between users, right? Um, in existing centralized platforms, you have a customer service uh, team that deals with uh, disputes between users, but we don't have this in the decentralized world, right? So because these companies want to be fully decentralized, and so uh, the the vision of Claros is to build a dispute resolution system to which all of the decentralized companies of the ecosystem can plug. So they just send the, like the dispute, the smart contract selects Claros as arbitrator agreed between the parties, of course. And then when there is a dispute, Kleros and selects a, a jury uh, of uh, people who are going to analyze the evidence um, and they are going to vote who is right about the dispute, right? Uh, so this can be used, for example, for a website dispute. I have a, I hire some guy from another country or whatever for building a website for me in a decentralized platform. And we both agree that in case a dispute happens between us, so Kleros is going to be the arbitrator. Um, so, um, if everything goes right, the transaction is signed and so the payment is done and I get my website. But if there is a dispute, uh, so the money will stay locked into the into that kind of escrow and then this is going to, the evidence is going to go to Kleros and depending on how Kleros jurors vote, um, the money is going to go to one side or the other. And of course, all the process of selection of Kleros jurors is going to be uh, fully automated based on smart contracts, so like nobody can tamper the evidence, nobody can put their friends as uh, like jurors, or uh, so everything is fully transparent, fully uh, yeah, it's quite fast, 
and and cheaper than alternative uh, methods. So I think that Kleros is going to solve a very important problem that is uh, at this point uh, preventing the growth of the ecosystem. That is like the lack of some um, dispersal solution mechanism that is um, yeah accepted by lots of people. Um, Different projects started to build their own arbitration system because they saw that as an um, important thing for their platform. But um, like building a arbitration system is quite hard to do like as a side project. If you are building your website for so your platform for e-commerce, so you have to focus on your platform, right? Uh, you can't just build um, arbitration as a side project because this is a very hard thing to do. And we spend all our time building this. And so we want to build the arbitration system for all of the decentralized ecosystem. So that's uh, like the vision of, of Kleros. So you've already mentioned that one of the reasons for building a decentralized arbitration system is that other decentralized platforms need a decentralized arbitration system can, because they cannot really depend on the government courts in order to settle disputes. Like imagine if open bazaar needed to depend on the state of new york to settle its disputes that that would be a little weird wouldn't it so therefore you need decentralized arbitration uh, are there other advantages uh, apart from apart from this feature that um, that you think uh, like justifies the case for decentralized arbitration so you mentioned that you can make arbitration cheaper right or you can make it faster Give us a sense of why it could be cheaper or faster. So why arbitration? Why, why decentralization, right? Uh, I think that um, who explains this very well, so if there is a very good article by Chris Dixon where he, that the title, I think it's why decentralization matters, right? Why should we do this decentralized? So of course, one of the reasons is like, so uh, this cannot be controlled like by us because this should be uh, controlled by the community because this is going to deal uh, with lots of um, yeah, very high value disputes. Um, so uh, this should be in hands of the community. And also because um, in the long run, so the goal is not to have Claros do everything, but have people build uh, platforms uh, or like, yeah, applications on top of Claros technology, right? So uh, one of them is going to build uh, an application specifically targeting uh, e-commerce, Others are going to target like insurance, other finance, right? Um, and uh, if you are going to build something on top of a, a platform, so you are you want to be sure that this platform is going to be a decentralized one, so that, that you're not going to be locked in. So by um, uh, a big like monster, like a big future Google or Facebook of arbitration, right? Uh, so in this article, Chris Dixon he he argues that yeah. You have on in all these centralized platforms, you have this um, typical curve where you have uh, an early stage where the platform tries to bring uh, users or like developers on top of it by giving subsidies, and then when it has like enough market power, it becomes like a monopoly and starts to charge monopolistic rents. So uh, the point of building this decentralized way is that uh, every, everybody that's going to build on top of Kleros can know that they ha have a say into the evolution of the platform uh, and, the, and how it's going to be uh, working in the future. So I mean, it's like the same reason why, um, yeah, uh, we build this on Ethereum because it's decentralized platform and, it's, and not on top of like Google. Or uh, So that's a, a, an important feature of why Kleros needs to, to, build, uh, to be built in a decentralized way. Um, in order to be, uh, yeah, um, the the focal point, I'd say, of a future ecosystem. Okay. Um, so, of course, like the idea of crowdsourcing jurors uh, is very interesting, right? Like, so, so the uh, of the idea with Cleros would be that if let's say Federico and I, we are the buyer and seller, and we enter into a dispute, then the dispute is going to be resolved by a juror or a set of jurors and these jurors have been crowdsourced by the Kleros network. They have been picked out of a group of relatively pseudonymous or anonymous people. The underlying assumption in crowdsourced juries is that the scale to resolve disputes is widespread in society because like anyone can be part of this crowd that wants to be jurors and therefore anyone can be selected to be one of the jurors that would uh, arbitrate our dispute. 
do you think the skills for arbitration are widespread in society or do you think that this is a skill that is specialized and it needs its own specialized people or specialized community so for now we are uh, focusing on uh, the low hanging fruit so dispute which uh, do not require a high amount of knowledge to solve um so in like in in, in the pilot in the example of a created list of uh, of those picture you don't need any kind of particular skill or the skill that you need to to learn is really easy to to learn uh to uh, to be a juror so i think crowdsourcing it's um really efficient when it's task which do not require expert in uh, this particular task um due to crowdsourcing that also mean that you can if you have more demand for a dispute resolution you have kind of people joining the system people exiting the system in a way smoother manner uh, compared to a company or a state uh, based institution and uh, with with crowdsourcing you can uh, you can lower costs because you can have a juror with a not uh, necessarily expert uh, they can it can decide activity they can walk be before okay i have some uh, like one hour in a train uh, to to spend and i'm going to solve disputes in this one hour in the train um that's if you were in a centralized company you would have to hire someone uh put him some office hour and he will be he will have to be paid whether or not there is dispute um so it's it's way less flexible and so flexibility should uh, decrease cost and also the fact that it's a decentralized system and uh, no one is locked in it uh means that you cannot charge a monopoly rent uh, as as Federico explained before uh so due to these three reason uh we can uh, lower the cost of arbitration uh by uh, crowdsourcing it for a uh, easy to solve dispute so easy to solve is not necessarily linked to low value uh so for example if you if you make some uh, some financial contract some contract for difference on the price of the ETH um it's something which can uh be worth a million in the dispute but the resolution of the dispute is quite easy it's what was the price of ETH at this particular time and no one require a specific skill to do so so you have disputes which are good for crowdsourcing some where it's harder to crowdsource uh and for now we we will look at the one which are uh, good and easy to to crowdsource so there's a, there's a couple of things I'd I'd like to unpack here. So one is uh, uh, when I was reading your white paper, reading through, uh, I think one of the examples was uh, a website design. As a former person working in web technologies and having uh, worked as a UX designer and worked for clients and and um, and work with designers in 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 the U.S. in Europe and also uh, in in Asia. Um, one thing that we uh, observe is that there are, at least in this particular space, uh, some cultural sensitivities that uh, are inherent to each region or specific countries or this sort of thing. So, you know, it, this sort of brings up the point that the shelling point uh, or focus point, in my opinion, for, for certain types of decisions may have cultural implications that uh, would make it difficult to arbitrate. So I'll give you an example. Um, so th take, for example, a, a, um, a European company uh, that hires a, a designer uh, somewhere in Asia, let's just say Thailand. Um, and that designer produces a, a design for a website or a mobile app. And there is a dispute. So let's say there's, there's a dispute about um, whether or not the design is something that would be attractive to customers. Um, and if uh, there, there could be a, a fault in the system where, for instance, if most of the jurors were coming from parts of Asia or where they would have similar sensitivities to uh, a Thai designer and perhaps little experience or knowledge of some of the sensitivities of European customers uh, where 
those jurors might favor, uh, might, might arbitrate in a direction that would go against the, um, the practical uh, reality, which is that um, you know, this design would, would not be uh, attractive to European customers. So that sort of brings us to the point is that shelling points you know, may or may not have some, some cultural or local uh, biases. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, we could also think of other examples, but what, what, what are your thoughts on so the way that people would converge around a shelling point for, for things that may have some subjective or, or cultural uh, biases? So it's not just asking uh, would this design uh, is, uh, is okay or not. Um, so you have uh, the contract, the plain English contract uh, between uh, like, I think the European customer and, and the Thai designer. Um, and you can also have specialized subcodes. You can have subcodes which are specialized um, by uh, either kind of dispute, but also by way to solve them. So you could have a subcode with some kind of like Asian sensitivity and some uh, one with European sensitivity in terms of, um, of which customer should the design appeal to. And this can solve uh, the problem where you have a different culture uh, which will give different answer. So in this case, uh, when you make uh, your contract, you decide that it's with this particular subcode, or in the plain English contract, you, de you decide that the customer should be uh, that the website should be appealing uh, for a European customer target, and this information has to be taken into account by the juror. And about the subcode, you will only get juror which uh, shows to arbitrate in a subcode with this kind of sensitivity. Uh, so that's the way to uh, to resolve the cultural cultural difference. And there is another thing that we could like think. So, the fact of globalization of business is a reality. So there are contracts between Western people and Thai people, and some of these contracts are going to end in some dispute, right? So, what other alternative for solution are for is there for this? And is that alternative like non-biased in the way that supposedly the shelling point is. Um, it's a, like a deeper question that affects, of course, Cleros, but any other system for arbitration between cultural sensitivities. Right, okay, I, I, I see what you mean. There's, there's another point I, I, I wanted to bring up, which uh, occurred to me while, while reading the paper, because um, I saw that you had a section there about, uh, you, you, there was a subcourt um, which specializes uh, in insurance, or the, you know, that insurance could be uh, one area that uh, uh, this could be interesting uh, for for arbitration. And uh, you know, last year I, I, I attended this conference uh, in uh, in Munich, which was specializing in, in insurance. And one one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this industry is that there's a major push in the insurance industry to um, to arbitrate using machine learning and and AI. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of startups that are building machine learning systems that do things like look at pictures of a car and assess the damage, or even listen to phone conversations and determine whether or not uh, someone may be being dishonest about uh, an insurance claim or something like that matter. Um, so there's, there's quite a, and, and insurance is, you know, is one industry where uh, machine learning is, is potentially disrupting a, a lot of people that are doing this kind of arbitration work. Um, it, there, there might be other industries where this is the case, but uh, you know, in, in terms of cost uh, and in terms of efficiency of arbitration, what what, do you, what are your thoughts on the potential for machine learning and AI to you know really uh, make arbitration much much more much more efficient than any um, you know wisdom of the crowd type knowledge could ever aspire to be. So at some point, you always uh, need um, some human uh, input uh, because uh, machine learning uh, can be used to help you in your decision, but not to make a uh, decision uh, instead of you. Um, because machine learning algorithms uh, are generally easier to trick uh, than human. Um, so uh, we've seen some, uh, some research 
on uh, reverse engineering some machine learning algorithm and uh, putting some uh, input which makes them make uh, completely absurd decisions. So you gave the example of, um, of the picture, of the car picture to assess the damages. Uh, if someone is able to reverse engineer the machine learning uh, algorithm evaluating the damages, it will perhaps be able just by uh, changing luminosity in a few places of the car uh, to completely uh, make the machine learning algorithm give a completely wrong decision. Uh, same for, uh, for the phone call. Uh, by using this particular tone, it's going to be able to trick the machine learning algorithm uh, into thinking that you are honest while you are not. Um, so I think machine learning are a really good uh, decision uh, helping tool, but you cannot rely on machine learning as to have the final say on problems which are adversarial. So if you want to classify uh, images and um, just, to, just to learn from them, it, it, it's, it's fine for to use machine learning. But now if you want to classify images where you have one per person which have an interest into the image to be A and someone who has the interest of the image to be B, they're going to try to, to bias this, uh, this machine learning algorithms. Very interesting. So we, we have sort of walked through, uh, we have walked through some of like these interesting design choices that, that Kleros has, like for example, cloud source, uh, cloud source judgment. Uh, we have mentioned this idea of shelling point as the current, current as the correct judgment uh, in Sebastian's questions, but we have not actually walked through that in detail. Maybe this is a good time for us to go through how Kleros the platform works or is supposed to work uh, at the end state. So assuming assuming that the dispute is between like, okay, Sebastian and myself, and one is a website developer and one is a company giving work, uh, how would the Kleros platform settle our dispute and what would be our user experience be like? Sure. So um, before the dispute starts, so you uh, agree with Sebastian. So you are going to build this website for me. These are the conditions. Um, this is what I expect. And so we agree on that. And then we agree. OK, so if something goes um, wrong, Claros is going to be the dispute resolution mechanism and for this. Right. And so um, you make the payment. And so this stays into an escrow smart contract. And it says locked there. Um, and if there is a dispute, the money stays locked, right? For um, it, it stays into the contract. And you both have to pay an extra uh, fee in order to pay for the arbitration, right? For the juries to be paid, um, you have to make an extra deposit. Um, so now uh, this goes to to dispute resolution, and maybe uh, Clement can explain better the the system or selection of the juries, uh, how the token works and how, yeah, all the crypto economics work for juries to make an uh, uh, honest decision. So as a juror, you are deposit uh, your token in uh, a particular uh, subcourt uh, that you think that uh, you have a skill to, to solve the um, dispute of this subcourt. Uh, and when there is a dispute, uh, one token per juror is drawn. And if this token belongs to you, you are a juror in, uh, in this dispute. So you're going to see evidence of both parties. Uh, you're going to see uh, court policies. You're going to see the plain English uh, smart, uh, the plain English contract. And uh, with uh, all those information, uh, you're going to take a decision uh, which uh, can be binary, like uh, party A wins, party B wins, or perhaps uh, more complex if we have more uh, party involved or more nuanced decision possible. Um, and if you voted, the same way as a final decision, you're going to get rewarded with arbitration fee and uh, potentially some uh, token of the parties which voted um, in opposition to the consensus. So if it's just a simple dispute with only uh, one session where you have uh, two party, uh, sorry, two jurors which say party A should win, one juror which says party B should win, um, and in this case, Party A wins the dispute, so the smart contract executes uh, the enforcement. So in the case of a website dispute and Party A is a buyer, it will be reimbursed Party A. And the two jurors which were uh, in the majority uh, win some arbitration fee and win some part of the token of the last juror which voted uh, for Party B. 
Um, obviously, you have a appeal mechanism. Uh, if, uh, as a party in the dispute, uh, you believe that the ruling was wrong uh, because the juror uh, were mistaken or uh, because the juror were bribed, uh, you can uh, pay uh, appeal fee and uh, appeal to get a more juror to look at the dispute again. And in this case, if there is an appeal, it's the appeal results which are going to be taken into account by your smart contract for enforcement and by clause. Uh, for a token and arbitration fee uh, distribution. The specific of the interface uh, can be tailored by case. So if you are in, with this website dispute, uh, you may have uh, to, to put the link to the website, uh, the link to um, uh, the source code in the plain English contract, you would uh, have specification. So the user interface is uh, something which are gonna depend of, uh, of the kind of, uh, of dispute uh, you will be uh, participating in. Yeah, for example, now that uh, we launched a pilot called Dodge on Trial, the jurors have to decide if an image is a dog or a dodge or not a dodge. So basically, in this case, the interface is like some screen where you have to see a picture and say, okay, vote. This is a dodge, not a dodge. And that's the interface. It can be something as simple as that uh, in this case. And the interface to display this evidence, it's uh, not something which is part of uh, the Claros application. It's something which is part of the arbitral application. Um, so in this case, like Dozen Trial, it's part of Dozen Trial. In the case of um, a freelancer uh, making website disputes, it would be part of um, the freelancing uh, application. Um, so people which are building or plugging into Claros uh, have um, a lot of liberty in uh, all to uh, to display uh, cases and, and evidence uh, to jurors. Of course, like one of the interesting, so there are many different components to, to your system, right? So the ones that I could spot is there's a, there's a component of jury selection, deciding who gets to be the jury. There's a component of, uh, depending on the case, like gathering all of the evidence and like passing the judgments. Right. There's a component of economics, which is that once you have a group of juries and they have put in their judgments, rewarding the juries based on how they how they followed the process or did not follow the process. So there's a component of economic incentives. And the fourth component that you have in your system is basically the component of specialization of some kind. Right? <laughs> like so not all juries are not all jury members are suitable for all sorts of cases. There might be some jury members that specialize in insurance, others in website disputes and things like that. So there's something that Kleros does for, uh, uh, in order to have juries also specialize. So like Kleros is a pretty complex system, right? Which has all of these intermoving parts that like connect together to make a dispute resolution system. Specifically, I would like to deep dive into the jury selection. Okay, how does jury selection exactly work? Uh, so when Sebastian and I are disputing, how do, how do you decide who gets to be the jury and how big the jury uh, would be in this particular dispute? So as a juror, you choose a, a pass in the support tree. Um, so this means that you can say, okay, I want to be a juror in uh, general cases, in um, e-commerce cases, and in uh, website uh, freelancing cases. So you specialize and specialize as you go uh, deeper in, uh, in, the, in the tree uh, up to uh, this end quote, which will be in this case, um, the freelancing uh, website freelancing subquote uh, and the parent one is uh, the e-commerce subquote and the parent of the e-commerce subquote is, is a general one. So this means that you can be drawn in those three different courts. Uh, when you are uh, registered to be a juror, you have to deposit tokens. So you deposit PNK in, uh, in those courts and your chance to be drawn as a juror is going to be proportional to the amount of token you deposited. So it means if you put more token, you are more likely to be drawn. Uh, obviously, if you put a number of tokens which are really, really high, uh, you're going to be drawn too much. Uh, and uh, you may not have time to solve all the, all the disputes. So even if you are really uh, rich in token, 
uh, you may uh, not have this much of, uh, of time to solve the disputes. Um, and uh, when there is a dispute, the arbitrable contract decides how much juror we start with. Uh, so in Dodge and Trial, we start with three jurors, but it's, it's a parameter. Uh, you can say, I, I'm dealing with dispute of really, really low value, and I don't want to pay that much in arbitration fee, so I want to start with only one juror. Or you can say, okay, this dispute has quite high value, and I don't want to lose a lot of time in appeal uh, because you, I, I know that small uh, small jury are uh, more likely to get wrong and easier to bribe than big one. Uh, so I have a, a dispute about the price of ETH uh, for a financial contract worth one million. So I'm going to start with 100 juror in order to not to lose that much time in the resolution of my dispute. Uh, so yeah, number of draw is something uh, that is decided by uh, arbitrable uh, contracts. I think that, so. The the main insight about the selection process is that first jurors self-select themselves into the court where they think they can arbitrate. So if I am an expert into websites, I'm going to so I have an incentive to self-select to arbitrate disputes into websites. And uh, if I self-select into insurance where I don't know anything about that um, or if I select myself into a court and then I don't really take the time to make the vote, I just vote randomly. So I am going to lose money because of how the system is, um, is structured, right? The tokens that I deposit to be drawn, so since I'm not uh, arbitrating correctly um, or honestly, I'm going to lose them. So in the long run, the system is structured for um, those guys who try to abuse of it are going to lose money and eventually leave. Uh, maybe it's interesting also to mention that this is loosely inspired in how courts worked in ancient Greece. So the you know the Athenians of the classical period they have this um, interesting concept that every citizen of the polis had the right to to judge, right? But they didn't want for anyone to go to the like the agora and become like a mob justice uh, kind of stuff. So they developed this very sophisticated mechanism for selection that was based on a um, token that every citizen had. Like it was an ID token uh, that you had, like your ID as a citizen, and you went on the court day and you put your token into this machine, like a two meter high machine with slots called Cleroterion. That means the altar of randomness. So it's like the place where randomness happens. And this was a allotment machine that selected, so some guy threw some white and uh, black dice on a tube affixed on the side of the machine. And if you had on your of, on your row a white dice, you went to the jury. If you had a black dice, you went home. So that dice, that 20 faces dice, called icosahedron, that's one of the platonic solids, it's actually Clero's um, yeah, logo. <laughs> so uh, Clero's system uh, is like loosely inspired in something that was tested before like 200 of, uh, 2,500 years into the past. Uh, and so that's, that's where the name comes from also. One of the differences between the, the Athenian system and Clero's that I can see is that in the Athenian system, when each citizen gets a token, it's one citizen, one token, and then the tokens are used to select the jury. Whereas in Clero's, uh, the, the token is the, is the coin, Pinakion coin, and the holdings of Pinakian coin can be very different between people, right? So, so somebody might have very little Pinak Pinakian. And if you look at like how the other tokens have panned out, the majority of coins are actually held by the crypto hedge funds. Like you, you see a system like Tezos or Definity, I don't know, like 10% of the supply is owned by Polychain, right? Because like Polychain is the biggest crypto hedge fund and there is no... Uh, no way around such an unfair distribution. So in Kleros, uh, my odds of being selected as a, as a juror are proportional to the number of tokens I have, right? So somebody that has a lot of tokens in a particular court, let's say I own 5% of the supply and I go to the website design court, there's very high odds that I'm, I'm going to be selected as juror repeatedly, even though I might not be the best juror. So 
do you actually feel that like with with this incentive structure the jury will end up captured by all the crypto hedge funds right because the like, crypto hedge funds might end up owning 30 or 40% of your supply pretty easily and so the crypto crypto hedge fund managers end up becoming the jurors do you see that as a risk to your selection process they are already capped by the amount of work they can provide so if you get 20% of the token uh yeah you can deposit all of them and get drawn in 20% of the cases but would as a crypto hedge fund do you have the time to to solve all those cases uh probably not so either you're going to solve them uh, in a sloppy manner and uh, be uh, incurring a lot of time and lose money uh or you're going to need to basically hire more people uh to solve the dispute instead of you so now it it start to look like more like pulling uh than someone having uh, 20% of the vote in the ancient Greece uh, model what you had uh, different is um that you can easily get identity of people because you get to see them uh why in the crypto world uh if i split my balance into two accounts uh no i'm uh, i'm two person and you have no way to know uh if i'm two person or if it's just uh, me which is civil attacking so you cannot uh, base the um, the chance of being drawn on uh on being someone because you can be lot of people online you can have lot of identities and the civil attack no um because of the non uh, one person one chance to be drawn uh you can see okay that means that there is a problem uh, there is some kind of democratic problem um and the democratic problem is solved in a different manner uh than uh, or it could be solved in like ancient greece and kind of like state system um because of the possibility of forking Uh, if you're in ancient Greece and um, y- there is a dispute, you have no choice. You are going to be brought to this uh, ancient Greece court, and uh, you have you have no say in uh, in uh, who is going to rule on your case. Uh, while on the centralized system, on the blockchain world, everything is opt-in. So um, the democratic choice is not made at the jural level, but it's made. as a party level in a dispute which can say okay i want this system to arbitrate my dispute uh, and i don't want this one because i think this one is a corrupted system and i don't if you only accept this system as a dispute resolution mechanism i don't want to make business with you so that's where the decisions the democratic decision come from from parties in dispute and not from uh, the juror side juror are more likely it, they look it look more like a, like a dao like a dispute resolution cooperative as an it will look uh, as a, it doesn't look like a state based institution at all so like we use this as inspiration because it's easier to understand but so uh, it's not that we are like just re- replicating the ancient greece institutions into the crypto world so it's, it is loosely inspired in the sense that <coughs> this virtual solution uh, uses some this crowdsource model so the greek had this very interesting insight about Uh, every citizen has the right to be a judge uh, and cleros is based on this peer to peer um yeah philosophy of everyone who wants to participate uh, in the arbitration process as a juror can do so under these conditions that are defined by the crypto economic system but it's not so of course there are many many differences between like cleros and the ancient greek uh, system So in the white paper, there's there's an interesting section uh, that I want to ask you about, and, and uh, so we'll have the link to the white paper in the uh, in the show notes. And anybody looking to understand uh, at a deeper level how Claris works under the hood should, should definitely read it. Uh, and uh, that that was a section about uh, random number number generation. Uh, the, the the process of selecting jurors imp- implicates uh, some randomness, and um, there there's a mechanism within Claris to generate random numbers in a decentralized way. Uh, could you explain how that works? So in, in, the, in the current uh, release, it's uh, for now it's just uh, some block hash, but in next release, uh, we will use a sequential proof of, uh, of work. Um, so the idea of sequential proof of work is that you start with a value that everyone can modify, but no one can fix to a particular value. So this means that You, you may start like with zero, with a block hash or whatever, and then anyone can 
give a local random number to make this seed value change, but you cannot fix it to a particular value. Then what people have to do is to ap apply sequential proof of work on it. So they have to hash it repeatedly some amount of time, which are going to take computational time. So you don't know the result instantly. You have to dedicate one CPU to, uh, to solve this result. And by the time that someone solves um, this computational problem, which is sequential, so this means that you cannot put more, uh, more computer into solving it, it's not possible anymore to modify the scene. So it's a deterministic process, but it's a deterministic process where anyone can change the point where we start from. And the time to know the answer is, uh, is long enough to avoid anyone from knowing the who knows the answer to be able to change uh, the seed. So you can know what the number is going to be, but when you know it, it's already too late. And that's a way to, uh, to generate a randomness uh, under a really, really basic uh, trust assumption, which is just you have at least one honest party which wants the number to be random. So basically, if you think if there is, that there is no one honest, you just have to do it yourself. And so since you know that you are yourself honest, you know that the number is going to be random. So the white paper also makes mention of uh, uh, your governance mechanism. Uh, could you... Uh, Lay, lay out the governance mechanism, what it's used for specifically, and how it works. So it's used for um, creating uh, the subcourts, the specialized courts, and setting parameters. So for example, arbitration fee, um, the amount of token uh, you can uh, win or lose uh, in, in disputes, if you are current or not. Um, and it's not a, it's a voting system, but it's not a classical one. Uh, it's a liquid voting system, which means that everyone has the right to vote in proportion to the, the token they, they hold. But it's a right. It's not an obligation or something that is expected from them uh, because they can either vote or they can delegate their vote to someone else. And this someone else can also delegate his vote to someone else. So you can have a um, transitive delegation. Uh, so A delegates to B, B delegates to C, C delegates to D, and then D votes yes. So this is like if A voted yes to. Um, because we want uh, two characteristics of the voting system. Uh, one, the first one is that we want everyone to have the right to influence every decision. So you need to let everyone the possibility to vote on everything if they want to. And the second one, is that you don't want the system to be uh, wasteful. You don't want to waste people's time. So you allow people to delegate uh, when it's a decision that they are not specifically interested in. So basically, you get both of the advantage of uh, direct uh, voting and, uh, and election. Let's presume that I, I want to make uh, a new subcourt about the quality of podcast editing. <laughs> Or something like that, right? What would that look like for me as a user? How would I propose this change? And then what would what would the process of uh, voting that new subcourt look like? So you will propose to create this subcourt. You will decide uh, what is the parent of this court. So you may have like a parent court, which is a media court, for example. So you will say that this court is a child of uh, the media court. Uh, you will write uh, basic policies of the court. Uh, you will determine uh, how much each juror of the court uh, have to be paid. Uh, you will determine uh, how much token they need to put at least and which percentage of those can be lost if, uh, if they solve dispute uh, in an uh, incurrent manner. Um, then it will be put for review um, by anyone which can claim that your proposal is invalid. So if you just like, I don't know, like write a Ruby showing some people in your proposal, uh, someone will challenge this proposal as an invalid proposal and it will go to dispute resolution. And so if no one uh, had challenged this proposal, 
Uh, now everyone can uh, express interest in your proposal, still in a liquid voting manner. And if your proposal gets more uh, than uh, the interest quorum, uh, it's put to vote. And anyone can vote for it. And people which did not vote for it, uh, their vote couldn't as if they voted the same way as a delegate or the delegate of the delegate of the delegate, etc., etc. Uh, if uh, if the delegate also has not vote, voted. And once the vote, if the vote ends up into yes, uh, obviously the court is created. And uh, now people with dispute can specify that the smart contract are going to be arbitrated by this particular subcourt. Actually, so the, the podcast quality subcourt could be a quite interesting idea for implementing uh, for a curated list use case because you no know, cleros can be used to arbitrate disputes in curated lists. So imagine you can upload, uh, you submit your uh, podcast uh, to the list and some, some user can say, hey, this podcast does not have enough quality to be on this list. So now there is a dispute between you and the user and this could be adjudicated in Clear. So this is a, even if we um, usually focus on the use cases of escrow disputes because they are easier to understand. Uh, so Claros has many applications and one of them is to solve disputes in, in curated list and um, like the experiment we are running now, Dodges on trial is uh, based on a curated list use case of, of Claros. There seems to be kind of an intersection here with and when, once you get in these, these types of use cases, they sort of start to overlap with prediction markets in some sense. Uh, can you talk about that and, and maybe um, explore how arbitration can, can merge into prediction markets and vice versa? So prediction markets need dispute resolution. Um, so prediction market is oracle dispute. Is You ask question about the state of the outside world. Uh, which is a dispute resolution use case. And I feel like the project, which is most similar to Keros, is probably Augur. It's not a dispute resolution project, but in their project, they have um, the problem of the Oracle problem uh, to solve their prediction market. So they came up with a mechanism which have some kind of similarities with Keros. It's not the same uh, because they don't draw people randomly. They, instead, they ask people to stake on dispute uh, that they uh, that they want. So everyone can uh, basically self-select into a dispute. And we don't really think it's optimum uh, because it means that if you are malicious, you can target your attack on a particular dispute. While if we use a random draw, uh, you can try to attack, but then you cannot really focus your attack on something. Uh, but it's also something which uh, Augur is uh, basically you have to put a stake in a dispute. And if uh, your, uh, your side gets the biggest stake for some period of time, you win the dispute. And anyone can put a stake in the other side, and um, they have to put the stake in the other side so that the stake of the other side is at least twice the stake on the previous side. So if uh, the question is, has it rained today, you may put uh, one rep token on yes, and then someone say, no, I disagree. He has to put two rep token on two. And then if you have to say, no, no, it's, it's really yes, you have to put three additional rep tokens such that you have four on the, on the, um, on the yes. And if no one does anything uh, during uh, one day or one week, I, I don't know the timeline, uh, the winning side wins the token of the other one. So in this case, the yes side has four tokens, the no side has two tokens. So the yes side wins the two token of the no side. And yes is uh, considered to be the result of the dispute. So this also looks like a bit like shelling points um, because uh, if you put your token like the majority, uh, you get rewarded. If you put them like uh, in the minority, you get uh, you get penalized. And with that, they also yeah, have some uh, forking mechanism uh, which start automatically that we also have in Keros, but in Keros, it's not uh, it, it does not start automatically. Someone has to say. Uh, I think that the current level of the court is too corrupted, so I want to fork the system. Um, but yes, there is a lot of similarities between, uh, between Klaus and Augur, yeah. Very interesting. Of course, like, if you look at, like, current legal systems uh, for nations, you see that, like, many times disputes emerge because contracts are not drafted correctly, right? Like, the contracts under-specify 
what should happen and the courts need to add interpretation on what the contract parties meant when they were writing the contract like sometimes sometimes disputes are clear it's a yes and no question but many other times like disputes are more complex uh the contract parties did not foresee the particular situation happening a particular situation happened that is not specified in the contract dispute goes to court now the court must interpret what the parties meant when they signed the contract right and so um to do things like these um the courts have have different ways of uh, handling handling such things right so the court forces interpretation on the contracts based on the the laws of that particular jurisdiction right so like many of the laws are needed because when dispute arises and the contracts are not specified well enough you need a legal system to give meaning to those contracts and still be able to handle these disputes is there an element like that to cleros where even an under specified contract could be arbitrated i i think that this is the point where cleros is really really useful right because if you have a contract that is perfectly complete and perfectly clear so you don't need cleros because that's code enforcement like yeah this was this payment done or not was done everything in force is right so there is some a uh, principle of philosophy of right as you say that every contract is incomplete because they cannot foresee <clears throat> every uh, situation that could arise in the future so there is some kind of uh, yeah of subjectivity in um should this contract go to a or to b who, who is right about this website uh, thing right um the website dispute is not completely um subjective because there was there was a contract stating how many pages the website should have uh, what time frame should the website be deliver on or etc but it is not completely objective either right because uh, like a website can be done in different ways and many of these ways can be correct right so um the world we are building of smart contracts on code enforcement still has not solved this space of subjectivity that is really important uh, for a, a legal system right So um and this is where cleros can and where cleros and where humans can do a very important uh, contribution because humans are better qualified than probably AI for uh, this kind of subjectivity uh, questions. Um and about the question so so how should the contract be interpreted uh, at which jurisdiction so now you have a uh, in ordinary contracts so maybe in some financial contract it says that is if there is a dispute this is going to be settled in new york arbitration court right so now imagine you and i do a contract about the website and we agree at the beginning so the if there is a dispute it's going to be this uh, solved into a, a sub court of website uh, um with this characteristic sub court and um, so the jurors who are going to participate into the, that that court they uh know that the policy of the court says so contracts should be um interpreted in this way this way this way and so when they do the decision about who is right they're going to use those rules as their guidance for the decision so that's the jurisdiction where the contract is going to be settled interesting um so as we wrap up here let's uh maybe talk about the current state of the project can you tell us uh you know where where are things at right now and what's the road map uh looking forward So well um about uh, the current stage of the project we uh, did our token sale between uh, May 15 and July 15 we use a new method of um, token sale called interactive coin offering that was suggested by Vitalik uh, um, and Jason Touch for making distribution more fair uh, between participants um so this ended July 15 then on July 30 I think or 31 we launched our project um or or product into the ethereum mainnet this is a experiment called doge is on trial where uh, users or jurors have to arbitrate if an image um is a, a dog or not a dog and there is a lot of different uh, mechanism for incentivizing people and to try to see how resistant cleros is to different type of attacks and uh, so 
uh, people we invite you to to come to the experiment and submit images and try to fool the system if you can fool the system by making a cut uh, into the list uh, so you are going to get two ETH. so uh, it's a good incentive for you to try to to game uh, Kleros jurors and so now uh, we are focusing on that and all the learnings that we expect to have from those uh, yeah from those submissions and the, this experiment and then um, of course trying to go into the main, so in the real world use cases, because we already have a number of partnerships, for example, with uh, Ink Protocol to start using Kleros into e-commerce uh, e e website, e-commerce no, e disputes, like uh, in the Ink Protocol, they have this dispute. Um, we have other partnerships uh, with a, a cryptocurrency exchange uh, called Dither. So the next step for us is um, try to prove that Kleros can actually work in real uh, world use cases and can actually solve the problem that we expect it to solve. Um, so now we are um, recruiting people, we are um, completing the team um, and trying to make this very, very uh, exceptional team to tackle this very, very big problem. So on the state of the development, um, so we have uh, obviously the basic version of Claros, which is with uh, without support, but uh, with uh, the dispute uh, resolution mechanism, uh, the random uh, drawing mechanism, um, the token uh, redistribution mechanism, uh, which can be used uh, already by uh, by project which will uh, plug on it. Uh, but for now, we we just have uh, this. Uh, it's a funny game that, uh, that, Clara, uh, that uh, Federico explained uh, to test the system, where we want to test the system in uh, adversarial condition, where we give people incentive to try to break it. Um, next version, would, uh, we will have um, support. We will have some improvement of user interface. Uh, we will have uh, the governance mechanism, because for now, um, the only point which prevents the system to be really decentralized is uh, the lack of, uh, of, the, of the governance uh, mechanism. And uh, on, like in parallel, we have improvement of, uh, of Kleros and integration with, uh, with other projects and other use cases. Cool. So the place at which people can actually use your system is with Doge on trial, right? So that's the, that's the public facing experiment you're doing that all our listeners can participate in right now. Yeah, you can already use or you can already use Dodge on trial. You can already use your uh, PNK uh, to uh, to become a juror on Dodge on trial, uh, and we got something like almost uh, two hundred uh, submission uh, for Dodge on trial. Okay, that's that's really cool. I'm I'm actually curious what your first focus area is going to be. Are, are you going to like? focus on some kind of cases at first specifically, or will you try to build the general code first? So we already built a general code. Um, it is that we have the general code, which now is only plugged to one application, which is Dodge on trial. But if you want to plug another application now, uh, technically you can do it. Uh, it is that since the system is still in the early day, like it has been launched less than a month uh, before, we advise to wait perhaps one or two months after the launch uh, to be sure that on those test case it's work as expected uh, before putting real use case with money at stake. Uh, but if the, when, when the system like operates for two months straight without any problem, I think it will be ready to, to put real disputes, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, thank you Federico and Clement for, for joining us today. It was great to Discover Kleros. It's a it's a super interesting project. Uh, one of the leading projects doing you know justice systems on on the blockchain, and we look forward to having you back. Uh, let's say a year or two later when your system is further along and actually proce processing commercially useful cases. For our guests, thank you for joining us. Uh, we release uh, new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Tuesday or Wednesday. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite pod podcast app like Stitcher. You can also watch the video version of the show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. We have a Kitter community that you can join to reach us at. It's epicenter.tv slash Kitter. 
and please support the show by leaving an iTunes review. We always love to hear from our listeners. We look forward to being back next week. Thank you all.